This work has been done together with Esteban Castro, Flaminia Giacomini, and they are here in the audience. Uh, and I also want to thank uh, Baylock Hu actually for setting the stage for my talk. I'm actually interested in the same regime that he already introduced. So let me tell you something about the motivation for this work and then outline the, the talk. So imagine you have a single particle, a blue particle, and imagine that you have a well-defined background for this particle. This is a typical situation in uh, non-relativistic quantum mechanics, but also in the quantum field theory in a curved space-time. And we, of course, have no problems to look at the evolution of this particle in the background, and we can even build spatial superposition, and we know how to evolve this in time, but because time is well-defined. Okay? Now, a next non-trivial case is actually already a problem for us. And uh, imagine now we have two particles. And we have two particles, a blue one and a red one. And imagine that we put them in a spatial superposition. Now, we would like to have the same evolution um, for this spatial superposition, but the first question that we might pose in this situation is, which t? And now I explain why I think that's a problem. And the problem is the following. Imagine that actually the object of our observation, the first instant, is the red particle. Now, the red particle is in a, some kind of a background that is formed also with the blue particle. Now, if the blue particle is in a spatial superposition and we think about the massive particles, then we have a mass that is in a superposition. And imagine, for example, that we also go beyond the Newtonian gravity, and we have time dilation effects, then obviously the time dilation will influence the red particle depending on where the blue particle. Simply, the red particle has no a definite uh, background, and we cannot uh, easily define the time for the red particle simply because the blue one, which interacts with the red one, is not in a well-localized position. And of course, you can interchange the roles of the black and the blue particle. So which T? And honestly, we don't have a theory for that if you want to solve it precise enough. Now, the similar situation is if you do have a localized particles, but now particles have an additional internal degree of freedom which can serve as a time, as a clock, something which ticks and dynamically evolves in time. Now, imagine you have these two clocks, they are quantum clocks. And uh, of course, we would like to evolve these two uh, clocks according to some dynamical laws. So I have to put the clocks in an energy eigenstate, or a dynamically dependent state. And then I evolve this uh, clock and state of the clock according to uh, some Hamiltonian. And all, also, I have another, uh, again, a parameter t. But I may ask for the same reason, which t? Why? Because if I think about mass energy equivalence, then putting the clock in an energy superposition means putting the clock in a mass superposition. I have not defined, well defined the mass at this position. And to each mass, I can associate a different time dilation influence on the first, on the left hand uh, clock. And again, the poor clock on the left hand side doesn't know how to tick because it cannot. To, we can associate two speeds of the ticking clock depending on what the mass on the right-hand side is. Okay, so again, we don't have a well-defined uh, clock. Now, what I want to tell you in the next, uh, well, 25 minutes is uh, how to deal this situation in the regime that is usually far away from the problems that can arise in a quantum gravity. And still, this is, from the conceptual point of view, maybe a situation with which we have to encounter once we have a full theory of gravity and quantum theory together. And um, so the, the way how we approach is exactly in the regime that was already announced in the previous talk. And I will use this uh, formalism that is inspired by what we know from quantum information and quantum theory foundations uh, to deal with these situations and to um, show that there is kind of a limitation of the concept of time. OK, so that's the outline of the talk. Uh, first, I will introduce what is a clock. And uh, here, I take operational point of view. Uh, 
then I will show um, a complementarity between precision of time measurements at nearby points. And uh, further on, considering many clocks, I will show that this kind of interaction will lead to entanglement, and which limits then the notion of time uh, locally. And finally, I will recover the well-known and uh, 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 classical notion, relativistic notion of time in the classical limits of clocks. Okay, so what is a clock? Uh, what is a time? So here I take an operational approach, and I say that time is what the clock shows. Okay, so the clock is some uh, system which has internal uh, Hamiltonian, and for every given Hamiltonian, the, in order to define the single tick of the clock, I need to find such an initial state to have the minimal orthogonalization time, t orthogonal, such that the overlap between the initial state and the final state is almost zero. So the single tick of the clock is the minimal time that a given state needs to come into the orthogonal state. And um, this will call, be called orthogonalization time. The simplest case of such a system is just two level uh, clock. There is an energy gap between energy states of the clock. I start with a spatial su uh, with a superposition of energy states. I let it evolve. And I finally, after orthogonalization come uh, time, I get to the orthogonal state. In that case, the orthogonalization time is in worst proportion to the energy gap between the energy states. Now, of course, if you measure this time, uh, you don't know at which time to measure, and you can end up into one or the other state, and you will have in a quantum clock certainly a situation when you have a randomized uh, 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 time. And uh, this is not what we experience in the everyday life with the classical clocks. So how we can get out of this model and quantum mechanics a classical notion of time. And that for this, I take a model of the classical clock. And the classical clock is something which is highly dimensional, and I can think about the large spin J. Uh, essentially, the Hamiltonian of the clock is the projection of the spin along Z direction, so that's this line. And I can think then about, think about the huge like, uh, like block sphere of the spin states, where I cut the equatorial plane and then I look only on the coherent states which are uh, specified by the phi angle. This is the angle on this circle, okay? So that could be one state of such a clock. Um, how I will read out the time? I will take uh, P of EM elements, which, are divide, which divide the whole circle into 2 pi over R bins, where R is the width of the single time interval. And in order, this P of EM element will be defined as integrative fully over a theta angle, a spherical angle, but then only integrating this angle 5 in this interval such that I go through the beginning to the end of the time interval. Okay? So that will be the reading out of the clock. That will be the model of the clock. And then the probability to find the time k will be just, of course, the usual um, expression, which in the quantum opticians know that can be expressed through the so-called Q function, which is always possible, uh, positive, sorry, and this is an overlap between the state and the coherence, spin coherent state. Now it turns out, and this is something that uh, we have been done together with Koffler a long time ago, um, is that if the width of the bin is much larger than the typical uncertainty of the spin coherent state, then for large spins, Actually, what we um, uh, read out is a classical notion of clock in a sense that reading out of the clock will not disturb the evolution, and the clock uh, continues to evolve undisturbed, and the reading of the clock is deterministic reading of the clock. Okay, so that's a, a classical notion of the clock coming out of the quantum formalism. Okay, and that's the third ingredient that I need in order to proceed. And that's to remind you on the gravitational time dilation. I will work in the post-Newtonian uh, background, um, the first term in 1 over c squared um, um, expansion of the metric. And indeed, you know that the clocks that are closer to the mass uh, tick slower due to the time dilation given by uh, this uh, term. However, I will 
like to replace this classical clock with some quantum clock and recover the same notion of the time dilation. And for that, I need to define what is the Hamiltonian of that clock and how this Hamiltonian uh, acts uh, and interacts with the gravitational field. There are many possible approaches, even from the quantum field theory and going into the single particle regime. And there is a nice paper by Lemmerzahl, a Hamilton operator for quantum optics in gravitational fields, that actually did, does this expansion over 1 over c squared. So you see here the Newtonian part, and then uh, 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 further higher orders, 1 over c squared and higher orders in the evolution of the Hamiltonian of the system where we put the clock in the gravitational field. Now, the only difference to the Lemerzal uh, paper is actually that he considered really the masses, uh, static masses here. But since we have a clock here, we have to take the mass energy equivalence and replace this mass with an operator, which uh, still depends on the static mass, mass or rest mass, but also about, uh, depends on the energy of the clock uh, divided by c squared. Um, however, for I will not go into uh, very far into 1 over c squared um, extension. One possibility is just to take slow particles and an approximation of weak fields um, where you uh, then have effects of a special relativistic time dilation where the ticking of the clock depends on the motion of the particle or the ticking clock depends on the gravitational field. And this is something what we have heavily used uh, in the previous uh, work on this problem. But here I even go to the most crude as assumption, namely that I have static clocks and massless clocks, and I will only concentrate on the interaction between the gravitational potential and the uh, clock uh, Hamiltonian. So that's about the setting the, of the stage. And now we can think about interesting problems that we can deal with. Uh, with this formalism. Now, what I have here is on the left-hand side a quantum clock. So I have a superposition of energy states. On the right hand, and, and of course, then I have orthogonalization time, which is inverse proportion to the energy gap. And now imagine if I have here some classical law, clock, something which can measure the time very precisely. Then the question is how to deal and how to evolve this and how to find out what the clock will show. Because as I already introduced at the beginning, every this energy, ground and excited energy, will produce some kind of a gravitational field around this quantum clock. And, I, and in general, you will have some kind of entanglement between whatever the energy of the clock is and the state of the field around the, the clock. But this difference in the gravitational potentials, even if I take this crude approximation of the uh, Schwarzschild uh, uh, metric or only G00 tensor, part of the tensor, will imply some difference or uncertainty in the potential that this clock can feel at the distant x from the quantum clock. And since there is uncertainty in the potential, there will be also uncertainty in the rate of the time dilation of the, this clock on the right-hand side. And therefore, there is a complementarity relation between, on one hand, precision of the first clock, which is given by 1 over delta E, and also the precision or of the time reading of the, this classical clock. And when you multiply these two numbers, you will get something which is a universal kind of constant. It depends not of any property of the clocks themselves, not of the, of the Hamiltonian of the clocks, but only about depends on uh, the distance and, uh, and, uh, and the uh, coordinate time and the uh, universal constants. OK. Now, there is something, this is more or less phenomenological, what I tried to do. And also, I treated this clock as a classical clock. But now, if you want to have a full quantum description, you have to think about two quantum clocks. And I said it's a problem between two quantum clocks because for neither of them, there will be a fixed background. And we don't know how to deal with this. So the way how we can approach this is a really a simple toy model. And the toy model is the following. I first place the first clock in the ground state. And I say ground state is zero energy. Okay? Um, and then if I have a zero energy here, then the second clock uh, behaves or evolves as in a flat space time. So I know how to evolve this second clock. 
whenever the first clock is in a zero energy. Okay, then I can put energy one. Now, and I am interested only in time dilation effects, now the evolution of the second clock will be time dilated given specified by the energy of the first clock. So I have the solution for each of these two possibilities. Of course, I also have to evolve the A clock, and I know how to do it. A clock just moves into the A clock because a zero clock, a ground state into the ground state. An excited state will have still some phase depending on the Hamiltonian of the A clock, okay? Now, one of the lessons of the quantum mechanics is when you know what the solutions are for the classical-like states, you just add them up if you have, want to obey, lin uh, obey linearity of the quantum mechanics. And that's exactly the trick where we do that here. What we do is that, okay, now we have the same situation, and now I have an initial A clock in a linear superposition of ground and excited state, but I already explained how to evolve for each of these two possibilities the whole uh, structure. So the B clock will be either not time-delated or time-delated, depending on what the energy of the A clock is. And therefore, I can compute the final state. And if I look at how I compute this final state and collect all these terms, it turns out that the effective Hamiltonian is just the Newtonian gravitational interaction between A and B clock. Maybe this is not a surprise after all. Uh, but however, it was not imposed from the very beginning but it's, it was derived from the assumption that we know how, what will happen in the classical-like states and then linearly superposing thing. Of course, you can maybe take a shortcut and say, okay, they, the only thing that they can interact are the via Newtonian gravitational interaction and then replace the masses by the operators because we deal with the massless uh, uh, clocks, which will lead you again to Newtonian gravitational interaction. So now what happens actually, and using this Hamiltonian, what kind of effects we can obtain? We get entangling clocks via time dilation. When you start with uh, two clocks in a product state, each in a superposition of energy states, just to, that's the definition of the clock, then you will at the end of the row have entangling clocks where the rate of the evolution of the B clock depends on the energy of the A clock. And for this entangling operation, you can think about what is the time that the two clocks get fully entangled. Uh, here is given this time in the Planck units. So you have uh, Xi, which is the length in Planck units, and you have epsilon squared, which is the energy in Planck energy, and the time is then given in the Planck time. I will not give here the numbers because I will want to move into the situation which is more interesting than just two clocks and where the numbers are more kind of uh, reasonable. Um, now, one question you might pose is, that's nice, you have this Hamiltonian, you evolve this, and, but there is this T. I mean, you wanted to get rid of this T at the very beginning, so which T is it? Well, what is the operational definition of this T? Now, there is a, uh, or in, in this Hamiltonian that you evolve the two parties. Um, well, one, uh, an immediate answer is you take the third observer, which is the observer C, and you go to infinity, and then what you get is that proper time of these C observers when you go to infinity is, is actually the coordinate time, and this is this time over here. However, it's not a really operational uh, justification um, because of the infinities. And um, you may ask, is there anybody in the universe, in a finite universe, that will really measure this T and give an operational justification for that? And of course it is. You can take somebody who is on the finite distance and having uh, some um, uh, a clock, classical like clock, which has some energy uh, gap and uh, spin length, as I introduced at the beginning, one of these uh, ingredients for the talk. And then you can think and compare what would this clock shows in two extreme cases. One, when the energy is zero ground en energy, so flat space uh, time, uh, and the other one where, where, where you have a high energy. Now, in this first case, the 
clock, ticking of the clock will be with certain uh, rate given by the energy gap, as you see here. And in the other extreme cases, when I put them in the higher en energy, there will be some dilation given with the distance y. But then you can think, uh, what is the distance you need to put the C observer, how far you can put, should put him, such that these two states are for all practical purposes undistinguishable. And, and then you can calculate for any other uh, parameters you put in, inside this distance, and then for this observer on finite distance, uh, this will be the uh, reading of his uh, clock, the T. Okay, we have two clocks, but how about three clocks? Now, what you can do now is well, the same scenario. You sit on one of the clocks and look at the two extreme cases, and then look the other two clocks, how they evolve in time. And you already know what the Hamiltonian for the two clocks is. So here is the idea. Yeah, you are, if you are at ground state, then you evolve this without any time dilation, according to the Hamiltonian that we already ob obtained. And you are, if you are at the energy one, then you time delay this. And what you obtain is, well, uh, a pairwise Newtonian potential between each of the, of the clocks. Okay, what about n plus one clocks? Now you know already the answer. It's whole thing is uh, iteratively. You will get the pairwise interaction between any pairs of clocks. Um, but the interesting thing is now, let's put them all uh, in the energy superposition to such that they can really the, um, the, uh, record the time. And what you obtain when you trace out all up to one clock is that, of course, because of getting entangled all of the clocks, you will get the reduced density matrix in which the coherence is uh, lost. And uh, now you have the non-diagonal elements which are related to the visibility of the coherence experiment, the superposition experiments on the first clock, uh, where you'll see that there is some decoherence time uh, that depends also on the number of particles, number of clocks, the more the clocks you are, you have, uh, the, the, the larger, the uh, faster they decohere the system. Okay, and then we put some numbers like 10 to the 23, and some energy, uh, 10 GeV, and 10 to minus 15 meter, you get something which is 80 seconds. So I'm sorry for the experimentalists, but it's <laughs> rather theoretical uh, work, but what is maybe important is that the Schwarzschild rate is 10 to minus 45 meters, so you're far before any usual treatment of quantum gravity will forbid you to have a well-defined time. So that's a fact that kicks in earlier. Okay, and uh, I have uh, four and a half uh, minutes, as I understood. So, huh? yeah, thanks. Um, so that's the, you see that there is a, Whenever you want to define the time, you have a problem because it gets entangled clock with other clocks. But that's not what we observe in our everyday life and our uh, even uh, clocks that we have in our laboratories. They do not get entangled. So why then do they not get entangled? And here is an idea how to deal with this. Now imagine that you have two clocks. Um, they interact gravitationally as I introduce, and they are these classical-like clocks, uh, large uh, spin uh, uh, systems. And um, I really start with uh, two clocks that are not uh, in interacted and they are in factorized uh, states. Now, if I evolve according to this Hamiltonian and trace out A clock, the B clock will be, in general, apparently in some mixture where you have the single um, coherent states that move uh, and time dilated are depending on in which energy the A clock is. This is K time delta E. So the depending on in which energy state the A clock is, I will have a different time dilation of the B clock. However, if you look at the average phase, the average phase will uh, move with the mean energy of the A clock. This is exactly time dilation, as we know in the uh, classical uh, uh, GR. However, the there will be also kind of a phase difference, this, which corresponds to the broadness of this uh, uh, probability distribution. And since this is a binomial distribution, the effective broadness goes as a square root of JA, whereas the average phase goes with the JA, with the length of the spin. And here is the square root of the spin. And this allows you, actually, to look at the regime of times which are uh, 
much lower than some characteristic time, one over square root of j. And if you are in this regime where this uh, gamma is much, much smaller, so you are for all times that are much, much smaller than the characteristic time, then the broadening of the phase um, uh, this distribution is something which is very small, such that for all practical purposes, actually those um, uh, single coherent states in the mixtures are highly overlapping, and therefore you don't have entanglement between A and B. Um, uh, clock, and moreover, even if you look at these classical measurements in which bin I have my uh, state of the clock, it will be within one bin, and you have a deterministic notion of time. Of course, if you go beyond this time, then you can have entanglement, and the notion of time will start to get randomized. So I'm finishing. Um, you can go into the real master equation description of these clocks, and you will see the unitary part, which depends on the B clock, not only from its own Hamiltonian, but also of the mean energy of the A uh, clock. And also you have a decoherence part, which is actually proportional to the variance of energy of the A clock. It depends how broad is the energy of the A clock. We, this derivation is really literally follows the one which we had before in, uh, for other purposes. So with this, I'm coming to the end of the talk. Um, what I try to show that there is a problem with uh, this idealized picture that coming sometimes from the textbooks of GR, that when you want to define the event in the uh, space time, you always put imaginary clock at every uh, position in space. But this imaginary clock, if you think about as a physical clock, will necessarily get entangled and spoil your uh, coordination of the uh, uh, time, uh, time for the events. So there is a complementarity between local and time in nearby regions. We treated gravitational interacting quantum clocks in a weak uh, field uh, limit. Um, this implies some kind of a decoherence and limits our measurability of time, which actually is far before from the regime where usually black hole arguments uh, kick in. And uh, we recovered the gravitational time dilation as the classic limit of the model. That's our group. The, this happy face belongs to the Esteban. He is the first author of the paper. And the second happy face belongs to Flaminia. So with this, I conclude my talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>